Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis, and I'm the Executive Director of the Ohio Chapter of APA and Vice Chair of the New Urbanism Division. And I will be the moderator for today's webcast. Today, Friday, February 20th, we will hear the presentation, Planning for Immigrant and Multi-Ethnic Communities. For technical help during today's webcast, type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen, or call the 1-800 number shown. For content questions related to the presentation, type those in the questions box, also located in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen. And we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. On your screen is a list of the sponsoring chapters and divisions. I would like to thank all of the participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to their members. Today's webcast, in particular, is sponsored by the Pennsylvania chapter. To learn more about all of our chapters, visit planning.org slash chapters, and to learn about our divisions, planning.org slash divisions. On your screen is a list of our upcoming webcasts. To register for these, visit utah-apa.org slash webcasts. And to log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, visit planning.org slash CM, go to your dashboard, and select activities by provider. Again, today's uh, sponsor is the Pennsylvania chapter, and then you can select today's title. This webcast is still pending for 1.5 CM ethics credits for live viewing only, so check back in the next few days uh, for approval. Some recorded webcasts are available for distance education CM credit, and for availability of this, check the webcast webpage, again at utah-apa.org slash webcasts. And like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive up-to-date information on our upcoming sessions. And we are recording today's webcast, and it will be available on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast on YouTube. And a PDF of the PowerPoint will be available at ohioplanning.org slash webcast presentations. All right, with that, I would like to introduce today's speakers. Melissa Kim is an adjunct professor at Temple University's School of Environmental Design and a program officer at Philadelphia Local Initiative Support Corporation. Previously, she led creative placemaking projects at Asian Arts Initiative in Philadelphia's Chinatown North District and directed community economic development programs at the North 5th Street Revitalization Project, located in one of Philadelphia's most ethnically and linguistically diverse neighborhoods, and at the Village of Arts and Humanities in North Philadelphia. She holds a Master of Science in Community and Regional Planning and a Juris Doctorate from Temple University and a Bachelor of Arts from Amherst College. Next, we will hear from Jennifer Rodriguez. Jennifer is the Executive Director of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant and Multicultural Affairs for the City of Philadelphia, established in 2013 to ensure the well-being of immigrants and other groups. In addition to her work for the city, Ms. Rodriguez has served on various boards, including the Philadelphia Redevelopment Authority, where she is vice chair, and the Greater Philadelphia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Prior to joining the mayor's office, Ms. Rodriguez was vice president for community engagement and programs for, okay, I'm going to try this, Association Puerto Ricanos and Marcha, right? The Association of Puerto Ricans in March, where she oversaw the organization's efforts to improve quality of life for Latinos in Philadelphia. She is also a founding member of the Latino Professional Mentoring Network and the Greater Philadelphia Chamber of Commerce CEO Access Network. 
Ms. Rodriguez is the recipient of various awards, including the 2013 NFL Hispanic Heritage Leadership Award and the 2012 Rising Star Award from the Philadelphia Association of Community Development Corporations and has been named among the region's 40 under 40 and minority business leaders by the Philadelphia Business Journal. Born and raised in Puerto Rico, Ms. Rodriguez migrated to the U.S. in 1990 to pursue higher education. She holds a B.A. in Business Administration from Boston University and an M.A. in City and Regional Planning from the University of Pennsylvania. She is currently a Leadership for Change Fellow at Drexel University. Last but not least, we will hear from Stacy Chen. Stacy Chen, AICP, is a senior associate at Interface Studio, a planning and urban design practice based in Philadelphia. She received a Master of City Planning degree from the University of Pennsylvania School of Design, where she studied real estate development and urban design, and a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Chicago. Prior to undertaking graduate work at Penn, she focused on community development and social service programs for low-income and immigrant communities as a program manager for a settlement house in New York City. Her interest in city planning and urban design development after living in Asia for a number of years where she obtained transformations in Asian urbanism and, I'm sorry, observed transformations in Asian urbanism and gained fluency in Mandarin Chinese. As a planner, Stacy draws on research, analytic, and graphic skills, as well as her international and cross-cultural experience. So with that, I am going to turn it over to our first presenter, Melissa Kim. Hi, uh, this is Melissa, and um, uh, the first slide should be up great. So, you know, today we can almost take it for granted that uh, planning for immigrant and multi-ethnic communities is both important and relevant. The question that we're trying to get at today is how to do it. So we wanted to start by walking you through the experience of what it might feel like to be an immigrant. So think back uh, to a time when you traveled outside the United States, uh, to a place where you didn't speak the language. And remember or imagine what it feels like to be surrounded by the unfamiliar, and the feeling of disorientation that that brought. Suppose you wanted to accomplish two simple tasks. Get some groceries and get a library card. Seems simple, but the signs and symbols and the customs that you are used to are now illegible to you. So if you plot your journey using a map, it might look something like this. Uh, if you come across some street signs, they might give you information that looks like this. You eventually find the market, and it's completely different than the Whole Foods that you know, and it looks something like this. So next, you head to the public library um, to fill out an application, and the form looks like this. Uh, you realize that you need a state ID, and the form looks like this. So um, the images that you've just seen depict Korean, Chinese, Burmese, Arabic, and Aramaic languages. And what's interesting is that the people, um, people live these scenarios right, not 7,000 miles away, but less than three miles from the center of Philadelphia, and likely in the communities where you work. So as planners, we, have to th we are confronted with a question of how to plan accordingly. Uh, you can advance to the objectives, Stacy. So we wanted to share a few insights that we've gained from working with diverse communities. We're going to present some background information on historic and current trends, introduce some relevant concepts and issues, and then share some strategies and tools that we've uh, gathered from our work in the field. And um, because this is an ethics seminar, we wanted to also uh, draw your attention to the fact uh, that, um, that uh, planners uh, have a, you know, are required um, to engage in inclusive planning um, and serve the public interest. So um, uh, if we advance to the next slide, um, we'll start with some key national trends. And um, uh, Jennifer will take it from here. Thank you, Melissa. 
So uh, let's give you a little bit of context of, of what are we talking about and how the immigrant influx has varied over the years in, in the United States. So this graph, of course, as you can see, shows you really over the last 100 years um, how uh, the United States, what we have named the nation of immigrants, has really uh, transformed itself in, in some ways. So we have seen that uh, after the 1920s or so, we really lost um, the influx of immigrants. So it has not been until very recently that once again this our nation has re-emerged as a gateway for immigrants. And it is only now that we, in the, in the 2010, for example, that we have come back to levels of immigration close to 12%, not yet reaching our maximum um, historically, but getting close to it. So I'm going to show a few slides that really show over the, over the decades how immigration has changed in, in the United States. So early in the 19th uh, in the 19th century, or, or late into the in, in the 2000s, I'm sorry, uh, in the 1920s, as we can see here, um, immigration really concentrated along the coast. Um, you can see the purple really indicates the Western European nations were the uh, majority of the source of immigrants, uh, while the red shows uh, immigrants from Latin America, uh, Mexico primarily, right? Uh, so you can see how the intensity really tells you about the concentration of immigrants in this area. If you go to the next slide, you will see how, uh, as the initial graph showed, really we have lost the intensity of immigration into the United States. Um, but yet the immigrant population is still primarily from Western Europe, Russia, and Eastern Europe. Next. So in 1965, immigrants started in with a, with a higher influx into the United States. And now you can see that immigrants are not only locating along the coast, the east, the north, the south, and the west, but they're really starting to, um, to really settle in, in what you might not traditionally consider to be immigrant gateways, suburban and, and interior of the United States. And by the 2000s, we can see how Latin American and, and um, immigrants really are the majority of those settling in the, in the country. And again, they are not only settling in what you would expect, Texas uh, and California and, and Florida, but they're really starting to migrate to the interior of the United States. And we have lost the immigration from Russian, Eastern Europe, and Western Europe immigrants. At this point, uh, really, Latin American immigrants uh, begin to, to dominate uh, the influx. So who, um, who are these immigrants that are coming into the United States? So we can see that predominantly Mexico um, produces or, or brings to us the majority of the immigrants, as, as we can expect. Um, but there are places in the United States where in Mexican immigrants are really not the majority. So we can see that. Um, so we, you can. It's important for you to really understand the nature of the immigrants in your community. It is important also to note that immigrants. Uh, you might have refugees, asylees, that come from countries that where there has been a lot of uh, political unrest where they have been persecuted. So immigrants come to this nation for many reasons, some of them economic, some of them uh, to reunite with family members, and some of them because they have been persecuted in their country. Another really interesting um, uh, demographic fact is that immigrants really are, in the, in, that have settled in the United States, are really of prime working age. So immigrants, as, as we probably, as you have probably heard from and uh, from, from media and from reports, uh, they really uh, fill uh, a gap in our labor force. They tend to, uh, to meet needs in the higher, uh, high-skilled and technology fields, and they also help our nation meet the needs in the very low uh, service-oriented, labor-oriented fields. And we may think about farming, we may think about uh, hotel service and, and, um, and food service industries. 
And here we're looking at some trends. And what's really notable is really how the white non-Hispanic population in the United States has changed over time and how the decline, a pretty steep decline, decline is projected to, the tw to 2050. Conversely, we can see how the Hispanic population has uh, rapidly increased in the 1970s. And if you see the, uh, the last column, they're expected to increase in popu the population growth uh, over 500 percent by 2050. Other groups like Asian Blacks and, and African Americans are uh, expected to remain uh, pretty constant. So if we look at uh, our city, Philadelphia, um, this shows you why in some ways we really need to think more intentionally about planning for inter intercultural, multicultural, and, and immigrant communities. Philadelphia, as you can see in this map, uh, the different colors show you different ethnicities, so uh, black, um, African Americans being blue, uh, Hispanics being yellow, and uh, green being white. So Philadelphia, as you can see, is a relatively, uh, is a pretty segregated city. However, there are areas in which we are seeing a lot of integration of different cultures. And so these are areas where, where really we want to, to be very cognizant and aware of the different needs of, of uh, immigrants and, and people settling there. So you see in, uh, in the north of Philadelphia only has been identified, you can see toward towards the top, also Oxford Circle, and the south, um, the Italian market and South Philadelphia. And this more clearly shows uh, where uh, the foreign-born population in Philadelphia has been resettling. Um, and and in, in Philadelphia, unlike in the United States, Mexican community is not the top immigrant community. In Philadelphia, the Asian population dominates um, our foreign-born population. So we have our top countries of birth are China, Vietnam, and the Dominican Republic. And what's important about this is to, when you look at your cities and, and where you live and where you're planning, is that the diversity of immigrant community really poses challenges in terms of communication, language being probably most one of the most important challenges that you need to overcome. Um, in Philadelphia, um, because of the diversity of our population, we really uh, have to, to really think about uh, communicating and when we're planning and, and de delivering resources and services, what specific languages in what specific communities. So in Philadelphia, we find that 21% of the population speaks a language other than English at home. And of those, 10% really don't speak English very well. For example, when the Parks and Recreation Department and where, where the Finance Department and other units uh, like Health and Human Services are delivering, delivering services and resources, um, we need to really think about what languages and what populations are in our target area. And I will end. Um, I think Stacy will take it in concepts and issues. Actually, Melissa? I think. Oh, sorry, no. <laughs> Melissa? Oh, hi. I'm sorry, I couldn't unmute, but I'm back. So, um, uh, as Jennifer's slides suggested, um, the geography of immigrant communities is, is more complex. Uh, prior to, um, let's say, the 1980s, we could talk about immigrant communities as ethnic enclaves. And we could see that they were mostly concentrated in major cities in the West and Northeast. But today, as Jennifer um, uh, explained, it's really a nationwide phenomenon. And so um, this slide and the slide immediately prior shows you um, like what you might think of as a prototypical ethnic enclave. Um, we saw Chinatown um, in Philadelphia. And then um, this slide is um, a scene from um, the Latin Corridor in North Philadelphia. But if you go to the next slide, you'll see that immigrant communities also look like this. This is Queens, New York, known for having a high concentration of immigrants. This could also be any neighborhood. Um, the same is true for the next image. This is a predominantly Latino neighborhood in Philadelphia's um, Hunting Park neighborhood, but it could be any neighborhood. 
Um, this is a picture of a multi-ethnic neighborhood in Olney, which Jennifer referred to. But again, it could be any neighborhood. And so as we progress through these slides, and this is uh, Manhattan, um, you can see that they're increasingly less distinguishable from non-immigrant communities. So whereas before we had ethnic enclaves, um, now uh, immigrants are settling directly in suburbs. Um, immigrant communities uh, can also be uh, heterolocal, um, meaning not spatially concentrated, but dispersed and connected by other means, such as social, religious, recreational, um, and service organizations. Um, uh, retail centers, and social media. Some immigrant communities um, are transnational or denationalized spaces, places with dense networks that link it um, to other places across national borders. So these networks are created through transportation systems, telecommunication channels, um, financial institutions, social movements, cultural exchange programs, um, and then another type of geography would be the individual household. Um, those are increasingly multi-ethnic. According to a 2012 Pew study, one in seven marriages are between spouses of a different race or ethnicity from each other. Um, and so when we think about these geographies, we can see that um, immigrant communities are complex. And then the communities themselves are dynamic and always changing. So, while that seems like an obvious statement, it, it's, uh, it, it's worth repeating in light of um, the course of, um, or the traditional view of immigrant communities that we've had over the past, let's say, 100 years. Traditionally, there have been two main schools of thought, and that, that's been the assimilationist and the pluralist. So the assimilationists talk about a melting pot. And they imagine a world in which immigrants integrate into society um, and their ethnic, racial, cultural identities melt into that larger pot. Um, in contrast, we have the pluralists who aim to preserve racial and ethnic identity and difference. Um, you might have heard uh, of the salad bowl um, analogy. And it was the pluralists and the pluralist planners back in the 1960s and 70s that really gave voice to the idea of, um, uh, gave voice to underrepresented and marginalized groups. So this has been the debate for, you know, for years and years. And this is how we've always framed the immigration problem. But really, neither framework captures what's happening on the ground. Um, we propose that it's really not about, you know, adapting either um, school of thought, but really about um, thinking about them both at the same time. So um, uh, back in 2011, uh, when I was working um, up in Olney um, and working with a coalition of, of, uh, of immigrant groups, we, did a, we took a quick and small, dirty survey um, to find out what the needs were of immigrants. And we, you know, what we found out was that immigrant concerns are not special or unique. Uh, these are some of the most popular concerns um, from, I think, highest to lowest. And um, while some of them are specific, such as uh, immigration laws and status, issues of discrimination and language access, for the most part, these are issues um, that relate to access, access to social services, health, education, government, employment. Um, so you know, these are concerns uh, that are not unique to immigrant populations. And so um, when we think about immigrant issues, um, and you can go to the next slide, um, in the context of planning, uh, we see three main areas that planners could think about their work. Um, the first is language access. But we recognize that, that it's not really just about language, that the barriers go beyond language to more substantive issues. Um, the second is engagement and process, um, recognizing that planning and civic engagement, as Jennifer alluded to earlier, are, are Western liberal democratic concepts. So the idea of a public meeting might be a foreign concept to, um, to, some, to some folks. Um, and it might be contrary to, you know, it might to 
to an immigrant's experience, especially when um, mistrust of government um, is what prompted them to leave their home country in the first place. Um, another issue that I came across often when working with small business owners, um, immigrant business owners, is that oftentimes they had very limited time to participate um, because they worked really, really long hours. Um, and the third um, area that we could think about are the substantive issues um, of planning itself. So recognizing that Western culture and values are embedded in our planning practices and our planning codes. So um, you know, the idea that we plan for diverse constituents is really not new. It's really a classic idea in planning, but it's really now it's complicated by the idea that we have to account for cultural, um, cultural ideas. And the cultural ideas of what constitutes a normal household or good urban form or what's appropriate you know, use of a space, um, it's all complicated by, by, by immigration. Um, for example, you know, if we compare the US standards uh, for um, overcrowded households, um, they, they differ greatly um, from standards you know, in other countries. Um, if we think about the types of stores that we consider appropriate, you know, on a commercial corridor, it varies, you know, it, it, it varies dramatically um, across different countries. And if you look at certain ethnic markets in Philadelphia, like the Italian market, uh, the Mexican market, the markets up and only, they have very different ideas of what, you know, of what is appropriate to display inside, outside, the method of display. And so these are all things that that the planners should should consider. Um, and now uh, Stacy's going to talk about some strategies and tools. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I want to share with you uh, from our work at Interface Studio and with Melissa and Jennifer actually um, planning for communities in Philadelphia, some of the experiences from the field, both our successes and some of the shortcomings of the strategies and tools that we had used in our process. But first, I want to lay the foundation um, for these strategies. These, these underlie uh, what we do. And the first one that's really important is to take an asset-based approach. Um, and this is really it's, it's a shift in thinking, because oftentimes the media, policymakers, planners, academics, when we talk about immigration, we often talk about it as a problem that needs to be solved or managed. Um, you know, lack of housing, lack of jobs, deportation issues, racial tensions. And so the response to that is to establish programs that deal with these problems, but these are reactionary. Um, they're very important. Language access is incredibly important. Task forces that deal with these issues are very important. But there also needs to be another side of this, which is to recognize that there are assets and capabilities within these populations. So we are proposing a more comprehensive asset-based approach, which views immigration and diversity as sources of, of cultural production, community re revitalization, um, opportunities to introduce fresh perspectives and to have an exchange of ideas so that we're seeing people, populations, and communities not just as problems, um, but as opportunities. The second important um, theme is to bring an intercultural perspective on how to deal with difference. Um, this holds that culture and identity are not fixed, but that they are ongoing processes of negotiation. And this holds not just for traditional ideas of immigrant communities, like Melissa, Melissa talked about, um, in terms of ethnic enclaves versus more integrated communities. This, this holds true for every community. You know, there is no community that is just a fixed community that isn't changing over time, that isn't having an effect on other communities and people around it. So we are proposing that culture be, be viewed that way, that it is an evolving, dynamic, and hybrid thing that is continually changing um, through negotiations between these external and different pieces. Um, and what's really important about this is this is, is a way of building um, community, because it is a way of looking forward rather than looking to the past and looking to fixed identities that are based on ethnicity. This is a way of looking to develop together a shared future um, so that the key question becomes not 
where are you from, but what are we going to do together going forward. And this focuses on process. So rather than focus on what makes two people different, it's more about thinking through the way that we can respond to each other's differences. Um, and one important thing to remember, and Jennifer talked about this too, is, is using cultural competency as a way to, to respond to differences in a way that transcends barriers, um, uncover multiple stories and multiple values and multiple aspirations. So this is our proposal for adding an intercultural lens. And the third big piece is to be inclusive and expansive and to be intentional about this from the outset of the process. Um, one very important thing is to identify how people find information. Everybody gets information from different sources. And it's important, especially in an immigrant community, to think about sources such as ethnic media, sources um, from word of mouth through trusted community leaders, thinking about where people go to congregate. Um, in some communities, there may be bulletin boards. Um, there is also a very interesting tool called the Community Information Toolkit that was developed by the Knight Foundation that helps communities to assess their local information system, to see you know, what are all these avenues, and to really do an inventory and think about how, how information can be transmitted and received. Um, as part of our process, one thing that we will do at the very outset is develop a community participation plan. So from the beginning, we're thinking about you know, who are we trying to reach and how. How are we going to reach them? The second really important piece of this is building trust and relationships. This is through trusted people in the community, going through them um, as a channel, but also using the process itself to build trust. And finally, asking the right questions. So thinking about how communities work and how cultural values should be reflected in the spaces that we're working in. Um, so as Melissa said, you know, a commercial corridor in one community can look very different and function very differently from a commercial corridor in another, in another community. And, and the same goes for housing. There may be a tradition of multi-extended um, families and inter inter intergenerational families living, living in a household. And, and those are questions that need to be asked um, from the outset as well. And not just the right questions, but asking the questions in a, in a way that's accessible um, and in a way that makes people feel comfortable. Um, and again, this goes back to building trust and building relationships within these communities. So now I'd like to walk you through just a couple of the, the strategies and the tools that we have tried. And communication. Um, for us has been really important. Of course, there is the issue of language. And we always try to identify early on from the very beginning, again, like I mentioned, through a community participation plan, you know, what are the, the language of services that are needed um, for the community? And also, what is the capacity to deliver, to deliver these services? Um, translation and interpretation services are best when they're professional. Um, just having you know, someone in the community do the translation is, is sort of the second best option. But there are you know, certainly workarounds that, that can be made when needed. Um, one of the things that we found to be useful is if we don't have an interpreter to work with us, we, we oftentimes create things like you'll see on the slide here. On the left, we have a board that asks, you know, what do you think about the parks, for example? Um, and we have that translated into Spanish, and people can go ahead and write um, in whatever language they feel most comfortable with. We don't have to deal with the translation there on the spot. We can take our time with it later on. Um, and that's one way that we've worked around having, uh, dealing, with, dealing with language. Another thing that we found very useful is you know, inviting the ethnic media to come to events. They provide a bilingual reporter who will report back to the community, and that's a great way to get the message across. This is um, a newspaper article that appeared in Suwannee, Georgia, when we were working with the town, the city of Suwannee, on a on a comprehensive visioning that included a very large Korean population. So this is one way that we got the message out in that community. The public meeting is a very traditional format for for outreach, um, and it has 
different levels of success for us. Um, as Melissa had mentioned, you know, some people are, are wary of a format such as this, and it's hard to get everybody to come out at the same time on the same day. Some people work different hours, so we've, we've found that depending on the community, this can be successful or not so much. Um, in this particular instance, you'll see there are some folks wearing headsets. Um, this group managed to get the technology and resources together to do simultaneous translation so that when they were having the meeting, there wasn't this start, stop, and delay with, that you would have with consecutive translation. Would, a meeting would take twice as long, and you would have people, half of your audience, essentially not engaged at any given time. Um, in this particular meeting, they used simultaneous translation. That was wonderful. Everyone was on the same page at the same time for this particular meeting. Um, but the traditional meeting is, like I said, not always the best format um, for reaching not just a, an immigrant population, but any population. Um, we oftentimes use different types of meeting formats where instead of having everyone come at a specific time to listen to a presentation and give their feedback, we've had it more free-flowing. Um, we had a meeting recently that spanned like from 4 to 8 o'clock, so that way on the earlier side of the spectrum, the seniors came out. They didn't want to be out after dark, though. And then after, say, around 6 or so, between 6 and 8, we had really more of the community that was coming home from work um, and who would only be able to make it later in the day. And rather than have one single presentation, we had more of a, of a conversational flow. We had boards, and we had people stationed at them. So you could, you could just talk individually. And we found that that was a great way to handle um, that that sort of situation, that community, that really a, a formal meeting was not going to be successful. But no matter what, when you're gathering people together, um, making it feel comfortable, using food, for instance. Almost every culture likes to gather around food. That's just such a basic thing. But it really is an important and effective tool. Another thing that can be really a, a really effective way of getting people together is through organizing around a common cause. Um, a common issue that spans across the community, whether you know, however diverse the community is. In this particular community, this is Eastern North Philadelphia, um, claiming, cleaning and claiming vacant land um, was the issue. And the idea was to gather momentum for community uses for vacant land. And so there was a, a, a whole strategy to to literally go door to door, get people to fill out postcards to their council person to say, you know, we want to have control over this enormous amount of vacant land in our community that's having a, a, an impact on every block in the community. And we need, you know, we need to get organized and we need to decide what are the community uses we need. How can we transform these liabilities into assets? And this was one way of approaching everyone in the community and literally um, you know, getting them to sign on. And the picture on the upper right-hand side is the deliverance of all of these hundreds of postcards that had been signed um, by members of the community to, to council. Another method that we've used is to have targeted conversations, so focus groups. Um, this this is an example from Suwanee, Georgia. Once again, we did do a, a focus group specifically with the Korean community um, in order to drill down to specific issues that they faced, and also as a way to provide, in a very discreet space, a, a translator so that we could have an in-depth conversation. Um, what is That was very, very useful. Um, but what is really important and what we had more difficulty with in this particular process was taking that smaller targeted group and folding them into the larger conversation that we were having citywide. You know, there was still a, a gap there that really that really could have been could have been richer had we had that opportunity. Um, but even even so, even with the focus group, there was a lot of um, great stuff that came out of it and a very strong desire we discovered within the Korean community to have more um, civic involvement and representation within the city, and that's something that we we talked with the city extensively about and, and added to the plan. And now Jennifer is going to share a couple examples of targeted conversations here in Philadelphia. So 
Well, thank you, Stacey. So I think one of the things that I want to really bring to your attention is the idea of language access. Um, language access is really a, um, a uh, it's mandatory. It's a federal requirement. It really stems out of Title VI of the Civil Rights, Civil Rights Act of 1964 that guarantees that no person in the United States shall, on the grounds of race, color, or national origin, be excluded from participation in or be denied the benefit of or be subjected to the discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. And that really translates into an executive order from President Clinton in the year 2000 that really provide, that really required that any recipient of federal funds must provide meaningful access to their limited English proficient applicants and beneficiaries. So really what I'm saying, what I'm really saying here is that to the, in the manner that, uh, that any um, of us really is a beneficiary of federal resources, we have a mandate from the federal government to really provide meaningful access to services and, and resources. So when we're planning, that, does, that includes our planning processes. And so, so we are taking that very, uh, very seriously here in the city of Philadelphia. And so we uh, have a language access policy that dictates the way that we interact with limited English proficient um, uh, residents. And so what you're seeing here is an effort from the revenue department to really provide outreach in immigrant communities. So perhaps you're planning in your neighborhoods or in your communities or in your counties, and you find that you have very limited results, um, that your outreach to immigrant communities does not work. And what, I'm, what I've experienced is that typically what people normally or customarily do in terms of reaching out to communities is just basically take their English flyer, translate it into Spanish or Korean, and hand it out. And that's just really not going to get the community engaged. And I think you, and, and immigrant communities are not the only communities that do not respond to this flyering, right? Um, but that, as, as Stacey mentioned, and Melissa has mentioned, you really need to develop the relationships in the community. And the work that you do needs to be really culturally appropriate. So in this instance, uh, what we did is we used the targeted focus group, and we brought the community to help us actually develop the content for this flyer. And uh, we brought an English version. And the people in the community groups that we had in, in with the Vietnamese community and the Spanish-speaking community, um, they were bilingual, the members of the community that participated. And they really were very uh, influential in telling us how what we needed to know. Um, they told us about the placement of logos. They told us about, um, you know, when a you want to, you know, our nature in the, here in the United States is to try and make things very approachable. Right, uh, but that may not be a good tactic necessarily for immigrant communities because they want something to be formal when it's coming from the government. Right, so so really understanding those nuances becomes very important. Um, you have to understand that in many instances, uh, things that look official, that m they may be perceived as being uh, uh, mandatory. Right, uh, the idea of government asking for an opinion from a an immigrant, uh, the immigrant may not think that that it's optional. They may think it's a requirement. So, there the relationship between immigrant communities and government is something that you need to understand very well. And the best way to navigate it is by finding the trusted sources in those communities that can help in the translation process. Right, and not only. Not, you know, you, you need to get uh, uh, certified interpreters and translators to do the official work, but in really you need translators so that or, or bridges between co and liaisons between the work that you're doing and the communities, and they'll help you navigate and it will help you really give you cues and tell you how is it that you need to approach the community to really uh, be accessible to them. And here is again, um, you know, the result of, of this of this effort in which we brought the immigrant community from the beginning, uh, at the outset of the process, to to develop communication materials that were very successful. And in terms of you know, so we've talked about about traditional ways of communicating. Um, clearly. Uh, 
language access is, is a federal mandate, but it's an unfunded one. And so it can become very costly if you don't plan for it well and if you're not creative. So, uh, so there is um, a, a growing segment of uh, information and technology um, sectors that are trying to sort of come into the space, recognizing that, that our communities are increasingly di linguistically diverse. So there, um, there's technology from, from companies like Textus and Verbalizeit uh, that are able to do translation on the spot on an as-needed basis. Um, this mechanic translation is not 100% successful. Um, clearly, uh, idioms and, 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 and grammatical nuances are not well understood in many instances by this, um, by this technology, but they are a step in the, a step in the right direction. Um, and and sh uh, surely the technology will advance. In many instances, uh, the, the, the traditional way of really having an in-person interpreter do continu uh, simultaneous translation is probably, if you're doing uh, 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 group presentations, is probably the best way of doing it. Um, but, but these are things that, as the demand grows, we expect they will become more and more successful. Great. And this is Stacy again. Um, I want to move into a couple other strategies that we've used. One-on-one um, -on -one conversations is, 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 you know, interviews basically. Um, but in this instance, we are working with Melissa actually up here in on North Fifth Street and Olney, um, which uh, in the original map of Philadelphia you saw is one of the most ethnically diverse communities in the city. Um, there are people from all over uh, living in this community, and there is also a longtime um, African American community um, that you know there's there's definitely a little bit of of tension between the longtime residents, some of the newer immigrants, and some of the businesses on this commercial corridor, and you know there's a little bit of a gap there. So one of the things that we did was we held our our interviews in a local business. Um, and this was one way of making it just more comfortable and casual and conversational for those people that we were interviewing, um, but also a way to introduce different members of the community to different businesses in the community and try to help break down some of those barriers that we were hearing about between residents and businesses and provide people with an opportunity to try something new and, and see what is literally you know, outside their front door. Um, so this was a great experience, and a lot of people that we talked to had never even been in there, and was like, "Oh my gosh, they've got you know they've got great things." So that was a that was a nice um, out uh, outcome for us. Another thing that we did was a mobile survey, which in this case took the form of just one question: "What's your big idea uh, for this commercial street?" And you know, make it really fast, make it fun. This happened to be at Halloween, which is why a lot of kids are dressed in costume. Um, but this was a way for people to weigh in. And again, like I mentioned earlier, um, it helped us break down some of those language barriers because people could write whatever language they felt comfortable in. We snapped a photo, so we had a record of it. And then we could always go and get it translated later. We, could, you know, we didn't need to have uh, a translator for every language right there on the spot with us. So that was another workaround um, in order to get to get the, the input we needed with you know, not as many language resources as we would have liked. Um, the upshot of this is once we got everybody's big idea um, answer, you know, we tallied it all up, and we found, just like Melissa found in her, in her short survey, you know, the things that people want, regardless of, of their ethnicity or background, are ultimately you know, the same things. They want a safe place. They want a clean place. They want opportunities to connect to each other and to build community. Um, so that, you know, that is some, definitely a theme that we've seen across these communities. And another way of conducting these informal conversations um, was a two-day pop-up event that we did on the sidewalk uh, all along this commercial corridor. And we made it something fun. So again, the last thing was done around Halloween time. This time we're approaching um, the holiday season. So we made it more of a fun holiday event. We had Santa there. Um, and then we also had a bunch of exercises that were designed to get people's input. 
but to go where people naturally were. Rather than have them come to a meeting at a certain time, we spent some time out where people were and caught them, offered them a free tote bag also for completing the assignments that we had. Um, and we got some really great input that way as well and got input from people who normally would never come to a meeting, honestly. Um, they're on their way somewhere else. You know, they had a few minutes to stop and chat, and that's about it. Um, and that's all we needed, and that was a, just a great way for us to get a more diverse selection of input. And now Melissa's going to take, take the next couple slides. The next strategy. Thanks, Stacy. So um, another strategy that, um, that Stacy uh, and I have used, uh, and Jennifer as well, uh, is that of uh, taking advantage of third spaces. So I mentioned inter interculturalism before, and Stacy mentioned it as well. And that idea that culture is something that is to be negotiated um, and uh, through interactions with what's outside of yourself and what's different, uh, you wonder what that looks like and where that happens. And it happens in what we call micro-public. I think Ash Ammon coined uh, the phrase. Um, and in planning, uh, we tend to focus on large public spaces uh, where people can gather and interact. Um, so um, a lot of that idea that public spaces bring about community is based upon this idea of contact theory. Um, and so really, in my experience, what I found is that uh, if you don't design um, intentionally and, and with a deliberate goal of bringing people together from different backgrounds, what you end up with is simply co-location. So um, I personally, in my experience, uh, working on the ground, uh, tended to disfavor large festivals and one-offs uh, for that reason. And I focused a lot of my work on in these micro-public spaces. And so um, Ash Ammon defines a micro-public space as a space where everyday lived experience and, and local negotiations of difference take place. So it's really a fancy way of saying um, your local coffee shop, your local library, schools, clubs, hair salons, community centers, and markets. And so this is where, through habitual interdependent engagement with people who are different from you, people with different backgrounds, this is where those folks are thrown together in a new setting, and then the, the, the um, the familiar patterns that you might know are disrupted. This disruption creates the possibility of forming new attachments. And so planners can create or nurture spaces to facilitate these types of encounters, creating these micro-public forums for people to come together. And as Stacy showed in, um, in her um, slides just now, you can also incorporate this kind of thinking into the planning process itself. And so. Um, in the next couple slides, um, I wanted to show you a couple of third spaces that we uh, that I've worked on. Um, uh, well, this is a commercial, typical commercial corridor, and um, those are often sites of social and commercial exchange. So I wanted to just highlight commercial corridors for a second. The next slide uh, shows a um, um, uh, a festival, an arts and cultural block party. Um, that Asian Arts Initiative uh, has now made an annual event. And this is the first one, um, not too many years ago. And it was a block party, and it culminated in a community feast. So this neighborhood is uh, located uh, just north of the center of Philadelphia, of, of Center City. And it's a pretty contested space. Um, this space is occupied by artists, immigrants, um, some folks from Chinatown, which is the next neighborhood over. And because it's such prime real estate, it's also pretty rapidly gentrifying. Um, and also, there's a sizable homeless population. So all these folks you know, have to, you know, are, are, are living within a, a very small space. And so um, what we found in the planning process was that um, you know, a, lot of, a lot of folks just had very different views. And so when we created this block party, we wanted to create um, a place where people could uh, find spaces for individual and collective expression, and that would uh, we wanted to create activities that would prompt uh, personal interaction rather than simply co-location. So uh, this image here is of uh, two people playing Chinese uh, chess. Um, 
the image prior to that was a photo booth where people could um, take on animal, like different personas of different animals. Um, this one here is uh, people engaging in um, screen printing. So the idea is that all of these uh, require action and activity. And then the next slide shows um, the culminating event of the day, which was a, a community furniture build. And um, it came about because the planning process was so contentious that we wanted to change the channel. And instead of focusing on differences, we wanted to see, create an activity, activity where people could come together, um, kind of like raising a barn. And so we assembled 100 tables and chairs throughout the day, painted them, glued them. Um, and then at the end of the day, we had a, a, a feast on top of the tables that we had made. So uh, Stacy's going to share another uh, neat project with you. Yes, and this is actually a project of, um, it's not our project, but it was a project that I wanted to share um, that the City of Philadelphia Mural Arts Program did in partnership with um, it, the Philadelphia Refugee Mental Health Collaborative that included um, a settlement house and um, mental health providers. And it was focused on the Bhutanese, Burmese, and Nepali refugee community that has settled in South Philadelphia. Um, so this is a storefront that was a formerly defunct property that was transformed into a community arts and resource center for new refugees. Um, and it was, a, it was meant to be a space to provide, um, to provide classes and also to provide the opportunity for public art projects like the mural you see here. Over time, however, so this started up in 2012 and has been going for two years now. And over time, it has transformed as community members and, um, and translators have taken over the space. So the idea, the original idea was to build a safe, supportive community space for um, refugees who, I mean, a refugee is, is basically coming from a place that is the very opposite of a safe haven. And so the idea was to make this a safe haven, a place for them to learn about one another, to get access to services and get plugged into their new community, um, and for them to, to talk with artists about what they would like to see in their community. But over time, it became a place that they, they took over and they, they programmed. And, um, and it really is a, a wonderful example of an assets-based approach, a give and take, where it wasn't just this refugee community coming in to take services and to learn ESL, but for them to, to teach to teach about their culture, to, um, to do what they wanted to do among their community and with the existing residential community around them. And so they organized all sorts of events, um, cultural food nights, sari giveaways. They had art therapy and art classes. They had after school homework. Uh, they had a grandparents club, and um, and then mural arts programs that 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 had youth help to conceive and design projects, um, and community members themselves were teaching a lot of these classes. Um, here's an example of a woman teaching um, teaching how to weave on a on a traditional loom. So this project um, really became a community hub, and it became a community hub that was that was really driven by the needs of of the members of the community, both the refugee community, but also other members of the community is open to anyone who wants to go down there. So it was a really a wonderful example, I think, of how there is this fluidity that identity is shaped over time and that there is a back and forth. Um, and with that, I'd like to just end on a summary of the lessons that we've learned through the process, um, the first being that planning for immigrants is basically just good planning. It's, it's good planning for everyone. Um, it's really important, though, to be intentional about the process and to take the time to plan from the very beginning of the project. And this means both in terms of budget and also in terms of time, because it does require both. It does require, it requires funds and it requires a lot of, of labor in order to add this layer, um, especially if there are language, um, language capacity issues involved. Um, building trust and working with trust organizations is really, really important in order to be able to even connect and to think about framing questions in order to make it relevant to people. Um, 
to think from a, an intercultural perspective and to avoid jargon at all costs, of course. Um, we found using graphic and nonverbal communication whenever possible is also a really important way to be as inclusive as possible and to develop a multifaceted approach. So not just um, a you come to us perspective where you're you know, doing a meeting and having everyone come to you or you're building a website and having people go to your website, but that you go out into the community as well. And and like I said before, this, just, this takes more time. It takes more legwork. Um, but the re results are so much better. Um, and finally, create comfortable forums for engagement. Um, make, it, make it friendly and make it social if possible um, to encourage people to be involved and not feel intimidated. Um, like Jennifer has mentioned before, there's a lot of different relationships that people have with authority and with government. and um, one way of approaching the community and building that trust is to come come at it from a softer angle. Um, and with that, I would like to go ahead and open it to questions, I think. Yeah, Christine. Great. Thank you. Yeah, we have questions coming in, and folks, feel free to uh, keep asking questions. Um, thank you to the, to the three of you, first off. This was great. And I loved all of the images that, that were included. Um, sometimes seeing these faces really inspires you. Um, okay, let's just jump right in. The first question is, uh, have any of you had to address the following issues? A community may provide information on, a, on an official form or application that uses English and then also provides it translated in Spanish. Someone may complain how come it's translated or provided um, but not in Chinese or German. Why is it just in Spanish? Um, do, has, have any of you had any issues with that? I can. I can. Uh, this is Jennifer. And I can, I can respond to that. Um, so, so there's, so you need to do your, your, your analysis, demographic analysis, right? Um, there is this sort of rule of thumb that says if a community, a language community reaches 10%, that's the threshold that you use um, in order to translate um, vital documents. So if you, if you really, uh, as your policy, you state that you will translate documents for com language communities where 10% is reached, then you can have your justification there. Um, you know, language access, again, there's a cost associated with it. So you, it's impossible in the city of Philadelphia to really translate into the, you know, 100 plus languages that are spoken here. We need to establish some thresholds. So, so a threshold that's commonly used is the 10% threshold. So you can always justify it, um, you know, your choices that way. Um, we typically say that we're going to translate things in the top, the, the top five languages used in the city of Philadelphia. So that's another way of, of justification. I think you just need to have a rationale. Why, why is it that you are translating in one, in one language and not another? But you should also be open to, to translating documents in other languages, particularly if the community is, if, if your budget is really, um, it's really tight, um, you might be able to translate documents in other languages. Uh, another strategy that we use in the city of Philadelphia is that the printed documents might be available in English and Spanish, but we may have the document available online in other languages. So that way, Spanish is clearly the second most spoken language in the city, so that um, budgetarily or in terms of resources, that makes a lot of sense, but the other languages are available, but we don't print the documents. You would have to print them yourself. Um, and that's another way of, of really thinking strategically about cost and impact. Great, thank you. Um, the next question, what about signing services? I'm, I'm assuming they mean sign language services. At public outreach meetings, um, professional signing can be expensive, no? The answer, the answer is, uh, this is Jennifer again. Um, sign language, yes. Uh, but again, um, these are requirements, are legal federal requirements. So. If the need is there, uh, there's really not an easy way out. Uh, so, um, so I think you know we say that the 
most cost-effective way of doing language access is by really ensuring that the staffing in your organization really reflect the community that you are serving. Um, that's not um, often that does, that's not the case. So you may have to um, to enter and to do outreach, and perhaps there might be. A volunteer in your community that is a certified uh, ASL American Sign Language interpreter. You may be able to negotiate uh, fees. We find in the city of Philadelphia we have contracted with a number of vendors. So the city has vendors for language access services, uh, and those can can really be costly sometimes, um, or can be costly you know on the aggregate, right? But what we find is that refugee resettlement from agency may have certified community members who are also interpreters or translators, and they may be able to offer them at a reduced fee. So I would just have those conversations in your community, and that may be a way of, of getting the, the resources at a lower cost. Great. Thank you. Um, and just as a note, um, this I, I just thought of this question, and I'm looking down now and see that, that someone else asked this question as well. Is there a difference between the term interpretation and the term translation? Um, yes, yes, there, there is. is. Written versus uh, spoken. spoken. So translation, translation generally refers to written materials, and interpretation generally refers to spoken. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, okay, the next question. So we, Philadelphia is, is a large city, um, and I'm sure we have a lot of folks on the call that, that come from either smaller cities or townships or even uh, suburban areas, and the budget and the resources just are not there. So do you have any recommendations for on an incredibly tight budget where there's not a lot of uh, money or folks to help out with this? Uh, do you have any suggestions on, on how to go about reaching these uh, community members? Well, I, this is Stacy speaking, and I, you know, definitely we've worked in different sized communities, so not just in Philadelphia, and um, it really, you know, when we are doing our community participation plan. We are working with the client very closely to determine what is the capacity that they have and what is the need and try to match it up as much as possible. Um, so the example I showed of you know, doing the focus group, um, like a Korean focus group, that was, that was one example of a workaround because we couldn't do Korean throughout the you know, through every step of the process. We kind of condensed it into a focus group partly because of resources. You know, it's like it's, it was it was out of need. You know, there was no way to, to expand and expand that throughout the whole process. And it's not ideal, but it's one way to at least get some level of input there. Um, and again, you know, although it's not ideal, sometimes using members of the community who may be bilingual, they may not be professional translators or professional interpreters. But at the very least, if you're working on a conversational level, you can get you may get some volunteers from the community to help out. Great. Thank you. This is Jennifer. I'm, I'm sorry, but I wa this is Jennifer. I wanted to add a little bit to it. I think um, uh, one of the things that we need to do is really educate our funders, our elected officials, and leaders in the community about uh, what language access is and what our requirements are, and particularly for, for those that are in, in government settings, um, really understanding that language access is not an option, it is mandated, and it is a requirement. And so once that conversation takes place, then you will find that suddenly resources might appear. Um, and so one thing that I would suggest for those that are interested is the federal government does have a website that is uh, uh, LEP, that's for Limited English Proficiency, right? It's www.lep.gov, and you'll find their guidance from the federal government on what is required and how to provide um, language access services. Great, thank you. Uh, next question. 
Um, federal and consultant planners often do not have the ability to build relationships. How does the planner from out of town interact with immigrant communities? This is Stacy. Um, so again, it goes back to our community participation plan. We try to do as much as we can up front um, with the client to figure out, you know, who are the stakeholders included among them these these trusted community organizations for whether it's the immigrant community or any any community. We are always looking to build a good, strong list of stakeholders that are going to help be our channels to reach the various constituents. So we really look to our, our clients to help um, us develop that list. And Stacey, I would like to add, you know, there's something that I say a lot that Community, there's no shortcut for community engagement. There's absolutely none. So you will have to put the time and the effort and the planning. Otherwise, you will not get the result that you want. So, so if you're coming from out of town, then you need to definitely, as Stacy said, develop, the, identify the leaders, do an, an asset mapping. Of, of stakeholders and, and engage and develop relationships with them because they are the surest way of really connecting with the community. Okay, um, the next question. Have any of you had experience with uh, reaching out to uh, children in hopes of potentially uh, getting the attention of, of parents to participate? Yeah, <laughs> I think I think that we we oftentimes do want to include children in the process um, for any plan, and for for many reasons. One of which is yes, we do hope that their parents um, will will come along as well, um, but also because we really think that there are some interesting perspectives that children have that are very very much worth listening to. So so we definitely do, um, and. And, or we'll piggyback on other things that are going on that are children and youth oriented. Um, in one of the more recent projects we did, um, we, we, we made a, what we called like a meeting in a box that had a bunch of activities that were, that were portable. Like literally we put them, we designed them so they all fit in this box. And, um, and the city took it and they took it around and they, they took it out to, um, I think it was over the summertime, so there was a lot of kids events going on. And, they took it out and got you know kids interested in, in participating and and um, we've got we got great input that way and you know you give out something fun like like stickers or something and and hopefully the parents kind of like you know wander wander in with the kids and, and get a little information that way too. Okay, uh, this is an interesting question. Is there any overlap between uh, being visitor friendly for foreign tourists and meeting the needs of the resident population? Huh. Um, this is Jennifer, I'll take that one. And actually the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> I think, um, you know, there's this, this movement in urban settings and, and well, it's growing right now, it's, it's the idea of becoming a welcoming city. And so the idea of becoming a welcoming city for immigrants, right? And what is it that tourist organizations do but be welcoming to tourists, right? So, um, so we actually have been sitting in a number of meetings with our tourist marketing companies in trying to really make Philadelphia a more welcoming place, period, right? For more welcoming place for visitors, for residents, for newcomers. And um, language access is something that's very important for, for the tourism um, community. It's a very important for the immigrant community. So I think you might find yourself, if you, if you went back to your counties, your cities, and you um, sat down uh, with the immigrant community and the tourism, marketing, hospitality industry, that you will find that there's a lot of overlap. Um, cities are trying to, particularly old industrialized cities like Philadelphia, are trying to go home. And so they're looking at immigrant, we're looking internally into who, what are our internal assets that will help us attract a residents and investment. And immigrants are a great source. Um, uh, we just conducted, um, we well, not, not the city, but the Welcoming Center for New Pennsylvanians, a nonprofit immigrant service organization here in the city, 
just conducted a, a study published earlier, well, last year in 2014, called Choosing Philadelphia. And it was a survey of immigrants that asked, why do you choose Philadelphia as a place to live? And the answer predominantly was friends and family, word of mouth. And that's, I suspect, the same answer that tourists get, right? Why do, why do tourists come to any city? It's because they heard about it, because somebody told them that was a place to visit. So I would encourage people to sit down with a tourism agency and, and really collaborate. All right, uh, next question. Have, uh, does anyone have any feelings either way about using Google Translate function on websites? Um, well, given that, that uh, again, Jennifer, given that I am the person that oversees the uh, language access program in the city of Philadelphia, um, it depends. Google Translate and Mechanized Translation are not 100% accurate. You need to really make a determination on how vital the document is, what are the legal ramifications and the risk, because uh, documents that are legal, that are technical, the translation will probably not be very accurate. So, and you really, there are instances, there's many instances in which you want the information that is being translated to be accurate because the risk to, to life and health um, is significant. Um, so you just really need to uh, prioritize what documents need to be translated and those that are vital are probably ones you want professionally done others that are just uh, casual and something more informal that does not really impact life and health, then you can make a decision of, of whether Google Translate is appropriate. Again, lep.gov, that website, has some guidelines and frameworks uh, that will help you make decisions of that sort. Okay, uh, there's a couple questions regarding commercial development and immigrants. Um, the first one, what is the impact that immigrants bring to the commercial development in Philadelphia? I can actually, this is Jennifer again, uh, there was a report just issued earlier in January by the um, Fiscal Policy Institute, America Society and Council of the Americas that actually looks nationally at the impact of immigrant entrepreneurs in Main Street quarters and it looks at Philadelphia. In the city of Philadelphia, 12% of the population is foreign born, yet 28% of businesses are immigrant owned. Between 2003 and 2013, 100% of all Main Street business growth was attributed to immigrants. So really we know how important, important uh, Main Streets are to the health and life and wellness of our neighborhoods. And in Philadelphia and really across the United States, all growth. Um, or most of the growth in Main Street businesses is due to the foreign-born population. So their impact is remarkably and outsizes their, their population. So uh, on a national basis, 12% of the population is immigrant and about 28% of business owned in, in, in Main Street um, are foreign-born. So it's, it's a significant impact. Okay, um, next question. Stacy, you mentioned a community information toolkit. Is it available somewhere? Yes, um, I think Jennifer's the one who first alerted me to this. It, I believe if you go, it's through the Knight Foundation is one of the major sponsors. If you, I think you can literally just Google community information toolkits and they have um, a bunch of things that you can download from their website. And it is, this is Jennifer, it's actually a really neat process to go through it. So, so it's, it's very, you're, one of the activities that you do is you bring community members into a computer lab and you ask them to find, there's a, it was almost like a scavenger hunt, and you ask them to go and answer questions by using the internet. Um, so so it's, it's really worthwhile. You'll learn a lot about how the a communications ecosystem in the community. 
Okay, next question. Um, let's see. Um, this can be a, a, a real issue in some communities. Have there been any problems with ethnic gang interruptions to community planning? Um, this is Stacy. I have not encountered that thus far, I have to say. Okay. Um, well, if, if either, uh, if anyone else has any comments on that, um, please interrupt me. Um, the next question is, um, have any of you worked or reached out to undocumented immigrants? That is, that, this is Stacy. That's a, that's one of those things that's sort of a don't ask, don't tell. So there's not, it's not like a, a way of knowing who you're talking to. We, we never ask that question. So um, it very well may be that we are, we are working with undocumented immigrants, but we just simply don't report that information. And this is Jennifer. The city of Philadelphia has an executive order that really prohibits any government agency, including police, from inquiring into the citizenship status of, of individuals uh, that we're serving. Having said that, um, depending on what your goal is, if your goal is to incorporate um, undocumented immigrants into the planning work that you're doing or you're reaching out to them to learn about their opinions and what they want and their aspirations, um, I would suggest typically there, there, there would be immigrant service organizations that can help you develop those relationships. Again, important in that is really developing uh, trust with those communities if you really want them to participate. Um, but, but really here in the city of Philadelphia we have developed, uh, we have the policies that really basically guarantee that undocumented immigrants are, are, are safe and will not be deported. Um, so establishing safe places where that interaction can take place is you know, paramount. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. What are some ways that we can plan for multi-ethnic and immigrant communities outside of public involvement activities? Can you repeat that again, please? <clears throat> Absolutely. What are some ways that we can plan for multi-ethnic and immigrant communities outside of public involvement activities? Well, the intention really is to integrate immigrants into the everyday social, economic, um, and, and political fabric of cities, right? So um, by I, that, to me, says that you don't necessarily plan for immigrants exclusive of planning and incorporating other groups. You can get really into very touchy, touchy, you know, very difficult situation there. Um, but really about intentionally including the immigrant community in the work that you do on a daily basis. And so uh, some of what we do is we, we go and we learn about the work of the different departments in the city of Philadelphia, and we ask them how are they um, serving immigrant communities. And if they are not being successful, then we bring immigrant groups and we help build the capacity of the department or the program to serve that community. But there's not a lot that we do that is specifically for immigrant groups outside of, of language access, right? Um, I would say that one thing that the city of Philadelphia does is we celebrate um, one week in September that we call Multicultural Passport to Philadelphia, and that is really one week of celebration of our immigrant heritage and our immigrant cultures in the city um, as an effort to really um, encourage intercultural exchange between the long-term Philadelphia residents and, uh, and the newcomers uh, that are that have so quickly populated our city. 
Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, this one. How do you remain inclusive while preserving the identity of a neighborhood? For example, the population in Las Vegas's Chinatown is 42% Hispanic. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's the nature of, of I mean, Stacy, you can probably answer, or, or, or Melissa. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, you know, there are different things that go on, and in a community that, like we have said, there's no fixed um, static community, and things are constantly changing, and, you know, there is certainly a, a, a an importance to a place that identifies so strongly as a Chinatown, for instance. Um, but these these types of traditional ethnic enclaves have always been changing as well. Um, like Little Italy in New York is is not that Italian anymore. The Italian market here in Philadelphia is much more Mexican now, and it's Mexican market as well. So I think there's there's room organically for these places to expand and take on new identities. And I, I imagine that's what is in the midst of happening in, in Las Vegas, Chinatown. This is Melissa. Um, yeah, I agree with, I agree with Stacy, and it's, there's really no easy answer. Um, I think, you know, I mean, that's a, it's, always, it's a hard question. And one group that's done a really good job of taking on this issue um, is the Wing Luke Museum in, in Seattle. Um, it's an Asian heritage museum, and it's located in what's now called the Seattle Chinatown International District, and it used to be exclusively known as Chinatown. But because of the influx of immigrants, um, they renamed it. And so you could imagine that something like that would cause a lot of debate and discussion. And so um, I would just, you know, Google that and look at the Wing Luke Museum and how they were able to navigate both, you know, celebrating Asian heritage and culture, but also recognizing, you know, that the neighborhood around them was changing as well. So I'm not really giving you an answer, but I'm telling you to look. I'm giving you sort of like a reference that you can go to. Um, and there's really no, there's no answer, there's no formula. It's really about, that's why it's a process of, of negotiation. Um, so I can't really answer the question. Okay. But I guess one, you know, one thing in Philadelphia that we have is um, a lot of cultural heritage institutions, a lot of the grassroots level. And they've done a very good job of carrying the mantle and preserving heritage. OK. Well, it's 2.30. So uh, I think we're going to go ahead and, and wrap up. Thank you to our presenters, um, Jennifer Rodriguez, Stacey Chen, and Melissa Kim. Thank you for joining us today. This was really great. And thank you to the Pennsylvania chapter for sponsoring today's webcast. Um, and everyone, have a great weekend, and we will see you next time. Oh, and also, one more thing. Um, there were a couple questions uh, regarding where you can access either a PDF or uh, a view a recording of this. So you can go to our YouTube channel, just search Planning Webcast uh, in, the, in the YouTube search, or uh, you can download a PDF of the presentation. Uh, and you can do that at ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And again, um, it's uh, it, uh, pending 1.5 CM ethics credits. So check back in a week or so to see if that status has been updated so that you can log those credits. So again, thanks everybody and have a great weekend.